We're checking out some uh, Mormon Truth video action here on the Real Deal on Mormon History, number five in the Especially for You series on that. I'm going to get into some changing doctrines and some really interesting stuff here. And you're going to see this one on the Mormon Truth video channel. So if you've been watching the other ones, we've gone over a little bit about Joseph Smith's early history using his seer stone for seeking for lost chickens, cows, and Captain Kidd's buried treasure, most famously. So today, what we're going to be looking at is Joseph Smith looking into his hat at his brown magical seer stone for the purpose of translating the Book of Mormon characters that he's not looking at. Since he's not looking at the plates, because the plates are hidden in a hollow log in the woods or something, according to the story. And David Whitmer has testified to this, along with uh, maybe Emma and some others. So, without any further ado, let me say adieu to this portion of the video and get started. Reminding you, of course, first to get into the channel, subscribe hit the like button, share these things so that others will know the truth about Mormonism's secret history and changing doctrines and cover-ups and you get the idea. Thanks. So I'm jumping into the part where Joseph Smith uses his seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon by looking at it in a hat. I'm jumping ahead at this point and it'll be a separate segment where we discuss his use of the seer stone for other things, seeking buried treasure and practicing magic and all that sort of thing. So instead of using the magic glasses described in Ether Chapter 3, this is actually using a brown rock and a hat, not looking at any plates, as shown like in this uh, painting. This is the way David Whitmer described him as translating the Book of Mormon, not using magic glasses, using a magic seer stone similar to a crystal ball except for it's not crystal, it's a brown rock. It's a little bit tougher to imagine using than a crystal ball for visualizing things, but this is uh, how it says he did it. Not looking at the plates. So, why did they make the plates if he could have just used magic, you know, to translate, uh, to, to receive a, a revelation? This is basically channeling. And uh, that's how the uh, original documents say that he did it. Although we're led to believe he was using magic spectacles, looking at plates, which showed English words instead of Egyptian. But instead it says the English words just appeared on the rock. That's the way, you know, Whitmer and Emma Smith said that he did it. Either way, he's using magic, which is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, what's he supposed to do, be an, an Egyptian scholar? Of course, the plates would have weighed a couple hundred pounds, and he was running through the woods with them, knocking people out in some of the church stories we hear. They really don't quite add up. Anyway, dealing with that in another issue, another episode, and well, let's, uh, let's see what he does here. Out of Isaiah, he said, well, the Lord wasn't too happy with the wizards that peep and mutter peeping at peep stones and mutter because they got their face on a hat maybe who knows I just thought it was a little ironic you know it's ridiculous so there he was practicing magic all those years he got prosecuted in 1826 when Josiah Stoll's nephew got tired of their uncle Josiah being taken by Joseph with his uh, <clears throat> searching for treasure practicing magic and Josiah never got any treasure that's a little long to be practicing magic after you supposedly had a vision of God, the Father of Jesus Christ, in 1820. None of that was historical. We, his own family's testimony about what they were doing, you know, when they were joining the Presbyterian Church four years later after Joseph Smith said that they did before the vision that never happened. And then he had all those other versions of it, and the church has got about four of them on the website now, and they try to blend it into one and make everything okay, but that's kind of like the harmonizing the Gospels thing. They don't harmonize, they're contradictory. And everything that we've got on 
there is contradictory. This whole history has been contradictory. So he was a magician and went by the spirit's instructions on a black horse at midnight on the equinox, the, the mountain supposedly to retrieve the plates. Good grief. I mean, none of it. You, you don't you don't really you don't hear that in Sunday school, do you? But we've got it all documented. We've gone through that. Then he starts the Church of Christ, later changes it to the Church of the Latter day Saints, and then changes it to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And then Joseph Field did Smith lies about that in uh, Essentials of Church History. And Gordon B. Hinckley lies about it in Truth Restored. Says uh, the original church's name was the Church of Jesus Christ, which is a lie. And then he said that came by divine edict. And then by inspiration, the words were later, later added of Latter-day Saints to the original name. Well, the original name was the Church of Christ. He doesn't mention that. Instead, he makes up a name. He doesn't mention the second name, because the Book of Mormon says you got to keep it the name, you know, in Jesus' name. And then he jumps it to the third directly from the first, which never happened. So he had at least three lies in there. And that's what we've gotten constantly, a flow of lies. Constantly. And that's what we've got on LDS.org right now. Now what do we got What do we got there on polygamy? What do we got in the Articles of Faith? He said we believe in following the law of the land. He said we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, and a few other things. So the story we're told about polygamy in the church is completely different from what it was. So what are we told? God wanted to restore all things, so he told him he had to practice plural relationships. So let's think about that. When Joseph married Emma, marriage is a contract, it's a legal contract, there are terms of the contract, the terms upon which she would be marrying him would be that he would forsake all others and cleave unto her alone. No other women. So we believe that the Lord God commanded him to break the sacred covenant with his wife of their marriage violate the terms upon which she agreed to that contract of marriage. Also to violate the laws of the land of every state that he committed this adultery in by pretending to marry these girls that are really concubines and you know that the church publishes on FamilySearch.org but you know about 30 some women that they say he was married to he couldn't marry any of them legally so by what did he marry him? It says it was 1843, supposedly, when he got that revelation, and it was 1835 when he got the some kind of sealing power, which doesn't mention anything about celestial marriage. It was 1833 when he was in the barn whooping it up with the 16-year-old uh, orphan girl, Fanny Alger, or Alger, that was uh, boarding at their home, living at their home, and being a nanny, earning her keep. Looks like the way she earned her keep got a little bit beyond what Emma was aware of until she peeked through the crack in the barn, saw what was going on, kicked Fanny out, and she was pregnant, pregnant teenage orphan. So is that what the Lord commanded? It's a little far-fetched, isn't it? Of course, we didn't really hear that story in church. We didn't hear about the Bishop Partridge's girls staying there in the mansion house. Girls, yeah, girls, teenagers. The Lawrence girls, whom were foster children of Joseph and Emma, whom he is said to be married to. There was no way to marry them, so they were concubines. Emma kicked them out when he caught... She caught Joseph in the bedroom. So, uh, yeah, the mansion house. <coughs> there... In, my, in our mansion are many rooms for many concubines. was kind of what that was about, it seems like. So, uh... 30-some women. Of course, Joseph Jackson said Joseph admitted it was over 400 in the spiritual wife system in Nauvoo, which was wilder than wild. Well, we'll just let that one go. The, uh, the church hasn't admitted to that one yet, but they, they do euphemize and call these other girls wives. Gordon B. Hinckley said polygamy is not doctrinal on Larry King Live. Well, if it's not doctrinal, then he's admitting that all these prophets that he gains his authority through were adulterers. Of course, by the law of the land, they're adulterers, and Joseph Smith said, what, what a thing it is to accuse a man of adultery. You say, I have seven wives, but I can find but one. That's right before he was caught. Caught for what? Caught for having the press destroyed that reported the fact that he was involved with multiple relationships and that they showed section 132, which he never showed to the church. They printed it, so he destroyed the press 
to completely con continue to try to put up the facade that he wasn't involved with any other women besides his wife. And that's not really the way the church portrays things. Uh, they say these guys were traitors and tyrants. Hail to the prophet, ascended to heaven. Traitors and tyrants now fight him in vain. Mingling with gods, he can plan for his brethren. Death cannot ha conquer the hero again. He died as a martyr. Earth must atone for the blood of that man. They were drinking wine and smoking in Carthage. Joseph had the guard go get tobacco, papers, and that was for Brother Richards, and wine for the rest of them. He didn't obey the word of wisdom. Not that day, and not many other days. He didn't obey the law of chastity. He didn't obey the law of the land. He lied about what he was doing. He didn't submit section 132 to the church. He lied about the first vision. He had multiple conflicting versions, and the historicity of the first one is provably wrong. The church has covered up in whitewashed history and is still continuing to do it on LDS.org, the gospel topic I say is, and we're supposed to believe that God favored this guy over everyone else to show up and visit him in New York. So, the polygamy issue was not polygamy. It was Joseph Smith was not a polygamist. He did not practice polygamy. And here are several of the uh, videos where his activities are discussed. He wasn't a polygamist, but he sure had a lot of concubines. And it was in the hundreds of women that were involved in the spiritual wife system in Nauvoo, Illinois. So, I have a number of videos that are on that. And uh, right here, just a little, do a little highlight here. This, uh, this, this girl in the pink here, she calls herself the Mormon next door. And she's done uh, a bunch of videos entitled, uh, her, her, her theme has been, What Mormons Believe. And so she did one, uh, actually she, she did a couple, I think. Well, maybe that was just one. On polygamy, I believe. Uh, calling it polygamy is just, you know, it has nothing to do with what Joseph Smith did. Brigham Young was involved in polygamy. And what Joseph Smith did was was uh, not, it's not accurately described by that word at all. So this girl uses uh, coercive persuasion techniques, uh, all sorts of uh, methods like advanced sales techniques is what some of them look like. For causing people to believe, you know, giving false evidence and so forth, um, or presenting, you know, saying, hey, look, we've got evidence to show you that uh, Joseph Smith was a reluctant polygamist. He only did it because God made him break his covenants with his wife, you know? He used to have bumper stickers on cars that said, the devil made me do it. Joseph Smith said, God made me do it. An angel with a flaming sword made me do it. I didn't want to be a philandering adulterer, unfaithful to my wife and the covenants I made to forsake all other women. Nope, God said, forget those covenants, buddy. Do what I say. I saw a comment on uh, some video recently, Some, I think she was a high school girl or something probably, saying, giving her testimony. She said, I write these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And I was going, oh my gosh, she's so mind-washed. And, and so what she said was, uh, in the early days of the church, Heavenly Father commanded polygamy to repopulate the earth, replenish the earth, in the early days of the church. So some other guy, you know, it's like ex-Mormon, he, he, he comments on there, he writes, so uh, how many children did Joseph have with these other women? Because they've done some DNA testing, they can't seem to find any. He didn't get into the abortion clinic and, uh, you know, Dr. William Bennett and, I mean, uh, yeah. No, John Bennett. John C. Bennett. William Bennett. Where did I get that? Um, speaking of where did I get that, I said that uh, it was on Larry King Live that uh, Gordon B. Hinckley said, I don't believe that, I don't think polygamy is doctrinal. Um, it might have been Mike Wallace. Anyway, I've got that on the, got some Gordon B. Hinckley action here. We've got, you know, videotape lying on national television and denying doctrines and, you know, saying all kinds of, Stuff that he knows is not true. He's such the PR prophet. He's, he's all about image. Image is everything, said uh, Andre Agassi on the Canon commercials. Well, Gordon Hinckley, he must have been an Andre Agassi fan because he, he was into the church's image. He did a lot to forward its image. And not everything he said was true, folks. Okay, magic and Mormonism. We got the Seer Stone. That is on LDS.org now, by the way. They took it out of the first presidency of Walden take some pictures of it or brought cameras in there so uh, in case you in case you're one of those people saying you're lying no 
they've been lying for a long time and now they're trying to make it look like they're honest about it and well it doesn't work very well okay magic and mormonism lots of magic and mormonism joseph, young joseph smith and seer stone so this is where we get into the details documenting things showing you know whether it's a personal journal or a documentary history of the church or the journal of discourses all of which you don't see on lds.org can't imagine why they just made history disappear that way it never happened but there's other people that have kept some things so they've they've got busted out the seer stone you know to take a picture of it and then trying to make it sound okay like they do on the schmoozing cover-ups on uh, LDS.org's Gospel Topics Essays, which should be labeled Mormon History Whitewash Recover-Up Apologetics, because they're completely dishonest. And I point that out so you can just look and see factually, yeah, here's what they said they were going to do, and here's what they actually did. Here's what they say the truth is, and then the scriptures say the exact opposite, and they, of course, ignore the scriptures when they said they'd be in-depth, straightforward essays. So they ignore the scriptures because they are contradicting them. Mm -hmm. Especially in the race and priesthood and the DNA ones. And the other ones, they basically just say, oh, you know, you can't ever figure it out, so what you got to do is pray about it. With the, the assumption that you've been pre-programmed into believing that if you're worthy, Jesus will answer you through the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if you don't get a testimony, you don't get the burning in the bosom so badly you need a whole package of Rolaids to cure it, you must not be worthy. Because, you know, Bruce McConkey, Elder Bruce R. McConkey, has taught us that faith is a gift from God as a reward for personal righteousness. Bruce. I read Mormon Doctrine by Bruce and Mortal Messiah and some of Millennial Messiah until I couldn't handle any more of it, and Doctrinal New Testament Commentaries, all three volumes! So, I read a little Mormon Doctrine. Gospel Topics Essays. The 50 Problems with Mormon Church video that I've reviewed multiple issues on. Putting the documented facts in on the issues that they bring up and very concisely note and name, but they don't have time in a 9 minute and 37 second video or however long it is to get into these details. It takes many hours to get into the details, but to do that then you can see this isn't just made up stuff. And I like to have stuff straight out of the scriptures too. Straight out of six scriptures so showing black and white contradiction. Speaking of black and white gospel Gothic essays, race and priesthood, they specifically say dark skin is not a sign of divine disfavor or a curse from God. It actually says that. And then you look at the Book of Mormon, for Second Nephi chapter five, it says the Lamanites were cursed. And Alma chapter 3, with a dark skin, and the Lord caused a skin of blackness to come upon them so that they would not be enticing to the Nephites, so they would become loathsome, which is basically revolting and repulsive, so that the Nephites wouldn't intermarry with them. But if they did, they would be cursed, and it says so. There was a mark put upon them, and it was a curse for their wickedness. Okay. The Lord God does not curse people with a skin of darkness, and it is not a sign of divine disfavor. It says... On LDS.org in the Race and Priesthood Gospel Topics essay, approved, mind you, by the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, as are all the essays, which is what it says in their, uh, what do you want to call it, preface to that section. And they promise to give us straightforward, in-depth essays and to tell us before that that God does not mean by his admonition to seek wisdom by studying by faith. He does not mean that he wants us to have signing off. But not before I tell you, please, subscribe, like, share.